Well, g'day, guys. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Mitch Stocker. And of course, this is Life in the Peloton presented by our partner, MAP. And yeah, this week I was down at the MAP lab. It was pretty exciting because I was releasing the Life in the Peloton book. Yep. It's out there, it's out in the wild, and it's being exclusively sold by MAP. So get across to map.cc to grab yourself a copy because you are not going to want to miss one of these. This is everything wrapped up in a book, everything you know about life in the Peloton. It's your manual to the Peloton what it is like to be pro. What I've done is I've got stories from my career, from other people's experiences, and I put it all in this manual to help you understand what life is like as a pro. So you can sit back there when you're watching the Tour de France coming up and just go, what the hell's going on here? You can flick through to Grand Tours and read about that. Or you can understand what it's like to get into the Grand Tours, get into the Tour de France, or what it's like to ride the classics, the cobblestones in Roubaix, All that stuff is in the Life in the Peloton book. And also, why not sit back and have a cheeky glass of red wine, the Life in the Peloton wine that we have done with our friends over at the Elderton Winery out of the Barossa Valley. Yep, we've done it. We've got our own wine. The drink while you're sitting back, watching the Tour de France, reading the Life in the Peloton book. What a combo. Well, speaking of the Tour de France, I've gone out and got him. Garen Thomas. What a guest to have on Life in the Peloton. I was sitting back there, and even though I know him a little bit, I was still starstruck because he is an absolute legend of the Peloton. 18 years in the Peloton. He started two years before I turned pro, and he's still kicking on now. Plus, in his career, he's done everything. Gold medals at the Olympics on the track. He's ridden the classics and been right up the pointy end as well, plus five times on Grand Tour podiums with, of course, the Tour de France win. I caught him in between the Giro and the Tour de France just last week, sat down with him while he was up there training, getting ready for this year's Tour de France. So I thought, what a better episode to put out right now on the eve of the Tour de France to hear from a Tour de France winner and see what he is thinking about what is coming up. Plus, we go back and hear about his whole career as well. How cool is this? Peloton Legal, a boutique corporate law firm coming out of Perth, Western Australia for clients who want high quality value adding advice. But what I love is the ethos. The founder, Sean McRobert, believes lawyers who focus on their mental and physical health come up with better ideas and add more value to their clients. Let's be honest, I think everyone can be a better person if we focus and put more emphasis on our mental and physical health in life. Things are getting way too busy. I'm feeling it firsthand since stepping away from the pro peloton and I can see when working in a high stress job, you know, much more stressful than mine, as a lawyer say, things like your physical health would slip to the side. These guys at Peloton Legal love all sports, especially cycling, running, tennis and golf. Away from the office, you're likely to see these guys in the back at Margaret River on gravel tracks. They also love riding in Sydney, Melbourne, Singapore, Beijing, or Hong Kong. Wherever they are in town, they're out exercising. I love that because that is sort of what we're doing here at Life in the Peloton. We're exploring all these different Pelotons, and I love that it's infiltrated its way into the corporate law form with Peloton Legal. Well, guys, let's sit back relax, maybe get one of those glasses of the Life in the Peloton Elderton wine and enjoy G. Geraint Thomas. Geraint Thomas on Life in the Peloton. Welcome, buddy. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on, mate. It's um, it's a bit of an honour to have you on the pod, even though you're a bit of a pod man. Um I've always wanted to have you on the pod and we I wanted to make line this up. So it was a long I took a long pass, didn't I? Try to G it up from a long way out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like um well, I can't remember when you got in touch now, but it was like just before Giro or so, wasn't it? And it was a bit chaotic. So I was like, ah, do it when I'm in Isla, a bit more time mm. and whatever. But you know what it's like? There's always something going on in there and you're always like, Oh, balls, I forgot about that pod. But uh <laughs> no, it's all it's all good. It's all good. So just sat on the terrace up in Isla two thousand. Yeah, I can't complain. Not bad. Mate, I want to go back to something. 2015, E3. Mm. Of course, I'm going to go there. E3, Harabaker. It's considered the last rehearsal before the Tour of Flanders. It's regarded as a semi-classic, which, you know, maybe it's a bit of an understatement. But it's used 
All the, it uses all the same hills and cobbles for the Flemish Ardennes as Flanders. For me, E3 defines what a hard man's race truly is. Attacking on the Quaramont, 35k to go, past Marcus Burgard. Stybar is the only guy who can follow you. Goes across Peter Sagan, gets into your wheel at the top of the Quaramont. You guys are working pretty well together all the way to the finish behind BMC and Katusha are chasing. 4.5k to go, mate. Mm-hmm. You head off. Yeah. Take me back there. Oh, it's mad that that's nine years ago already, but um, it does feel like it does feel like yesterday. And it was, yeah, I think as you say, that attack of the Quaramont was was stuff you just dream of. You know, it's like mm. when you when you're junior watching those races and you see guys like Fabian and Boonen, or you know, even before that, like you know, um, Van Pettigan and all these massive names. You know, and to be doing that and having the legs to do it, and uh, you know, getting a gap and. Yeah, the likes of like Steve Bar, who was, you know, in his prime back then, and obviously Sargon, like that was his, mm. that was the big Sargon years, you know, and yeah, to, to to make that move, force that break, and then the three of us to ride together, and yeah, I just remember feeling like, what, as they say in Belgium, you know, diamonds in the legs, huh? Like, uh, <laughs> just feeling really good, and um, yeah, then this this attack, I knew I wasn't quicker than both of them, they were, they were both quite quick, and um, so yeah, I just tried to hit them at the right time, and it got the gap, and it was only like maybe the final corner with, I don't know, four, 500 meters to go when I realized, well, oh, I've actually got this now and I yeah, mm. could really soak it up. And it was just a massive, like you say, you know, it's the, it's the last big race before Flanders. And it's kind of like the equivalent, I guess, in stage racing would be, you know, the Dauphiné before the Tour or something. You know, it's the um, biggest stage race in the build up to that. And um, yeah, it was an amazing feeling. And, you know, icing on the cake was the one I got my, uh, my weight in beer as well. So, uh, ah, they yeah. were doing that then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we got married that year in October. So, um, yeah, I emailed them a couple of months later. I was like, oh, any chance <laughs> of getting that beer then, please? And uh, <laughs> they sent it over. And yeah, it was amazing. What was it? Quaramont? Yeah, Quaramont. Yeah. So, um, they sent like, I don't know, there was a limit before you had to pay like a lot more in like taxes and stuff. So it was about 100 bottles, like litre bottles. So it was, uh, oh, so everyone's walking puppies. around the wedding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With these big litre <laughs> bottles. And, um, <laughs> Got a bit messy, but it was good. Did you get one of those massive Quaramon glasses as well? No, it was just the beers, to be fair. But yeah. um, but those those novelty glasses are probably only good for that moment. Like, when are you going to use one afterwards? Exactly, yeah, yeah. It's like those <laughs> bottles of wine, isn't there? The, uh, the glasses of wine, they hold a bottle of wine. Like, when are you actually ever going to do that? <laughs> Have a whole bottle in a glass. Yeah. Mate, the reason, the reason why I wanted to bring that up is I'm a classics man. I love the classics, and you – were a classics man. I think at heart, I've never spoken to you about this personally, but I believe you love the classics. You you were racing the classics. You way back in the day, I didn't realize this. You won Roubaix as a junior. Mm. Um, you were you featured in E three um, numerous times. You you featured in Flanders. You rode Flanders. Uh, you rode Roubaix the year you won the tour. So like, you are a classics man at heart. But like people these days see you as rightly so. You know a full grand to a rider, which you are now, you've had this pretty much, I, I summed it up in the last couple of days, you've had three careers within a career. You you yeah, started yeah. your career p- before I started mine. We're the same age. You started before me. You're still going now. You're just going on and on. But I sort of wanted to talk about today was this sort of three careers within a career to sort of understand how you've been able to do what you're doing now at 38 years old still at the at the right at the pointy end in the Grand Tours, which I sort of, and I can only imagine what it's like, the most stressful of of sort of jobs, three weeks handling that pressure, the preparation you guys do now. So I guess the question sort of out of all that is, am I sort of right in saying that there is sort of three careers within a career and that sort of allowed you to stay sort of mentally fresh to this sort of point in your life? Yeah, definitely. I think that's a big part of it. I think, you know, starting on the track, um, that was kind of like my first career, so to speak. Mm. And um, I remember like once I focused on the road after the London Olympics, I was 26, you know, I was, it, that's old these days, you know, to mm. just be going full on for, for one thing. And then it turns like the classics, as you say. And I was like the road captain on, on the road in like the tour and stuff. And I remember a few of the boys like being like, oh yeah, but he's just a track rider, you know, what does he know about mm. road racing? And um, it's funny how it, it changes over time. But yeah, and then, Obviously, those years racing for like uh, the week long races and the classics. And like you say, at heart, I think, you know, if I had to choose, I would say the classics are still like the biggest thing. Really? Yeah, I think it's just that's when 
my real first taste of like pro racing and and when I started obviously I loved the tour and that's why I mm. got into the sport but I think um when I was as as a junior going over to Belgium like we we'd go over on um the ferry and you know because yeah. it was only from from London it was only like 2 hours you know it was easier to go there than to somewhere in the north of England so um <laughs> I still had to get to London obviously it was only 2 hours so um but yeah it was you travel over there and and you know, we'd watch the pros racing and we'd do our little racing as well. And um, just walking into bars and just seeing old men sat there with a beer <laughs> watching the cycling, which blew my mind. You know, coming from the UK, like cycling was was nothing, you know, you know, yeah. geeks and dweebs and whatever word you want to put to it. But that's what they did, <laughs> you know, and, and, and everyone was in the pub watching the rugby or the football. And I just fell in love with it then. And, um, you know, it's just like you say, it's that hard man sort of image as well, you know, with the cobbles mm. and especially the the rain and the mud and you know it's early season in in Belgium like you're going to get bad weather and that was a big part of of my career really and then certainly the track gave me a lot to perform in the classics and then riding the classics gave me a lot to just when it comes to positioning and riding in the peloton mm. and all these things which are still crucial now as a as a GC man and um you know the less energy you can spend fighting for position and but still being in the right places you know goes a long way so yeah, and then obviously going and, and focusing more on stage races then is that change definitely, I think, um, keeps you fresh. Um, mm. But I think o over the years, the biggest thing as well, along with that is, is just being like being able to adapt and change your mentality and change the way you do things because the sport has changed, as, as you know, so much yeah. over the last decade with with nutrition and, and, and everything and the way you train, you know, because like in the sky days, we'd be going out doing like low carb rides and me and through me, mm. like without even saying it, we'd be, it was that competitiveness in the team in a good way, which, yeah. you know, we'd be seeing how far we could go without having a rice cake, you know, and yeah. we'd be doing like six hours in Tenerife with 4,000 meters climbing on two bottles of protein and, and a three egg omelet in the morning, you know, and the difference now is crazy. You, you we eat so much on the bike. So I think that adapting to the new, um, new ideas and stuff and being open to change I think is a, a big thing as well in that it's quite funny because hearing that you say that it's like you have to I always say this now to guys with nutrition you you almost need to find rock bottom and you almost need to do those rides that you're talking about to find out where your limit is where you break and where the where the actual limit is and of course we heard trickles of what you guys were doing and we'd look into it. And as you know how word goes around the bunch, you know, it's like Chinese whispers, you know. Yeah. You know, these guys had like one rice cake and then it went from no rice cakes, you know, they're not even eating rice cakes at all, you know, their whole life. So, you know, you've got to keep <clears> pushing the boat out. So everyone was doing that then. I, I exactly am the same as you. I think back to those days and think, how did we even do races like, you know, Paris Nice or whatever. I was just using those fat gels from um, that Swiss company, you know, like let's just keep it low until I, you know, inject <laughs> a little bit of carb towards the end, you know, let alone just being completely depleted. The change for me, and that's something I wanted to ask you is, look, I've been out now, this is my th I retired three years ago at the end of this year, and I see from the outside a lot change from the COVID, from the COVID period. You know, I, I think you'll probably remember when we, I did Strata Bianchi that first race back, and it was just like, whoa, what the hell was that? Yeah. And I remember that whole period going, cool, that was just like the crazy COVID races. And I started back at Hutvar the next year. And Hutvar was was harder than Paris Nice. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? Of course, I just decided to write, raise the white flag and went, you know what, I'm out of here. This is way too hard <laughs> for me. But you've continued on, clearly. Um has it just continued to go that way? And how have you been able to, as an older rider, still adapt to it? Because I feel that the re the rebuttal to that is, you know what I often say, these young guys, they don't know any different. This is what they've done. They've they've come into the peloton this way. The older guys are the guys who have to struggle to change so much with the with the new guys, I think. Tell yeah. me about the last sort of few years. Yeah, I think like with the older guys, you, you, you have these inbuilt beliefs as well. There's a set way of doing mm. things, don't you? And that's always hard to change. Like, and the new guys, that's just the way it's done. So for them, like somebody asked Pog the other day, like, oh, what do you think about this new way of racing from the gun, blah, blah, blah. But it's so all he what? knows. Like, yeah. that's the only way he's raced since turning pro, you know? So for him, there's no change. It's, that's just racing. And I think that's the thing with all these young guys now. And they also, um, you know, 14, 15 year olds, like, uh, doing it they've got power meters you know they're, they're eating mm. they've got all access to all the 
information about nutrition and stuff. Like for for me back in the day, I remember just you had absolutely no idea what was probably a good thing mm. as well, but you had no idea what the pros were doing, you know, it was just like this. There was no, to get that information was just impossible. Whereas these days it's all there, you know, in front of you and these junior teams and, you know, under 23 teams are, are just like pro teams now. Um, mm. So everything sort of shifted like earlier, you know, I think um, that's a big thing. And with the style of racing, this, I think the one good thing, I guess, for me now is the fact that, you know, being a Grand Tour racer is almost... The Grand Tours are obviously a bit more intense and every day you're racing, but it's not as punchy as the week-long races or, you know. Mm. So I think for me, you know, as you get older, you know, the general thing is you lose a bit of your punch and whatever. But I think over three weeks, you can still be competitive and perform. And so luckily, I guess uh, I'm competing in those races at this stage of my career, really. Well, it's a, it seems like a conscious way that you are riding, um, watching you in the, in the Grand Tours and it it must be a conscious thing or even fighting yourself not to follow things that you think you should and just go, nah, I can't go over my limit. I know how I have to ride. I know the way I need to attack this, you know, even just looking back at the Giro and seeing um, Ben O'Connor, the way he followed Pog early on in the race mm. and as exciting that was, you know, you sort of have to hold the reins back. Um, is that something you're consciously going and just going, you know, cool, that's the way these guys race. It doesn't suit me. I, I know the way I need to race. Or you're just literally like, that's I'm actually on the limit. I just need to <laughs> I need to just yeah. hang on here. It is. It's, it's just understanding your body, you know, knowing your limit and knowing that for if you're doing four four sixty watts, like I can't keep this going for the next twenty minutes. <laughs> like you know, I need to back off, you know, and <laughs> don't want to blow up completely. So it's just not possible for me to do it. Yeah. So, you know, what, what you got to just back off a bit and hope that they do slow down. But Hog doesn't, the rest do. So, you know, it's it's just the way it is. So, yeah, but it, it is, I like the, the style of racing. Um, the only thing is, though, I, th I think, I get the impression sometimes that people are just assume that back in the day was easy then. Like, oh, mm. you know, so-and-so today would, would smash it back then, you know. Or if I, if I knew what I knew now and I went back, then I'd, I'd kick everyone's head in. But... Would you? I, I think so. I think just because if you were the only one that knew that, but that's not, mm. that is not possible. You know, it's just, you only do what everyone knows at that time. You know what I mean? It's not like. But would you, the thing is, there. I guess there's a question is, the whole peloton is raising the level. If you're the only one doing that and you had to go, for instance, train on your own, push the level, eat that way completely on your own, like it would be, it'd be just like a mountain of just stuff to organize because the whole peloton's on that regime. Mm. It sort of keeps lifting it, do you think? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Like it keeps moving on and everyone keeps pushing forward. But yeah, yeah Dave B actually said to me once, he was like, yeah, if I, if I knew what I knew now and went back, like, mm. you know, I would have been so much better. Like I did all this, these mistakes back in the day. Well, everyone, it's like saying like, oh, if I just invested in, you know, Twitter or I don't know, <laughs> Tesla, then I'd be a millionaire. Well, yeah, of course, but that's not reality, is it? Like, yeah. you only know what you know at this time. Like, you, yeah, if you could time travel, then yeah, it'd be great. But yeah. I want to talk a little bit about back in the day, Barlow World. Um, you signed when you were 20 years old um, and young. Mm. And there was a pretty cool team, actually. I was looking through. Not everyone was in the team at the same point, but as your three years in Bali, you had Baden Cook there, Cummings, Froomey was in there, Gasparotto as well, mm. Impey, Hunter, even Swifty did a bit of time there as well. Really cool crew to start off there. Tell me about Barlow World in the beginning and the old times. Yeah, it was um, when you look back now, like those names like Mauricio Soler, who, you know, had, yeah. unfortunately had a bad crash and ended his career early. But yeah, it was. It was a great team. Like it was a great place for me to just learn just bike racing, really. Like it was it certainly wasn't as professional as Sky and like the World Tour teams, but it was a pro conti team and but you know, rode the tour that year, was rooming with Robbie Hunter and mm. you know, there was days you're just like, right, this is the point, you gotta get to here, just bite the bullet to here and then <laughs> Rupetto was gonna form and I I'd never make it there. I'd always be out the arse before that, but managed to get through it and it was a good group of us, you know, and, and Impey was there a year after I joined, Daryl Impey, and as you say, threw me, but he certainly wasn't the rider he, he became. He was he had this real raw talent that was obvious, but he was just like, well, he just grew up in South Africa, didn't have the the tradition of cycling, really didn't understand, you know, all the, the small things that sort of bike riders do and the way you behave and stuff. And mm. um, the DSs were, you know, they were good and they, they cared. Um, they weren't, the best in the world but 
I think it was just a real good grounding as well, really. Like mm. you, then you appreciate when you move on to bigger teams and, you know, more professional and you appreciate that more, you know, like, mm. without sounding like the old grumpy guy now, but like, you know, the kids these days kind of just e- expect everything. Yeah. I think just like uh, being in a, in a smaller team and, you know, just driving like four or five hours to races and like in your clapped out bloody <laughs> Leo or whatever or Polo it was. Um, it was just like, it was a great, it was a great life, but it just feels like a different career totally. Um, yeah. But they were, they were good times, yeah. Was it, was it focused? Like was, was it about being on the road to enhance your track ability? And, and you know, you mm. were on the road, you were signing that team, but ultimately you were trying to be good at the Olympics. Um, and it's, the road was just, you know, sort of helping you get that endurance or there was like clear path hey, I'm just getting this track stuff done and I eventually want to go, you know, and win the tour, you know, like when the hell, this is another question, but when the hell did that mm. thought come in? But let's talk about that first bit. Yeah, what was it all about then? Yeah, it was both really. It was a tool to get fitter and stronger for the track, but at the same time, it was a way of at least being in the pro peloton mm. and hopefully progressing and moving forward in that after the Olympics. So, because it was 07, 2007, where I joined Barlowall for the first year and I was riding well, hoping to ride Beijing Olympics in 08. So yeah, the, the, that was the idea. Just just go there and use that, the road racing to just become stronger, basically. But then at the same time, I was like, yeah, but I want to be, this is where I want to be and I want to move forward. And at that point, as you just briefly mentioned, the tour never even crossed my mind, especially after mm. doing it in 07, where I was last but yeah. one. Like, And actually, um, in the Giro this year, Van Severin, his dad was in that very first tour that I did and he was last and I was last but one. And um, I went up to him and was like, I was racing with your dad, you know? And he was like, wow, you're quite old then, aren't you? I was like, mate, it's unreal. Um, I was just about, just on that point, I was just thinking about that the other day. I was looking at these young guys. I'm like, quite possibly my son's seven and not that he's showing any interest in cycling right now. All he wants to be is an AFL star, but hmm. he could quite, quite possibly be racing with some of these guys, you know? Like, And I just found that, Mind blowing myself that that yeah. sort of the career feels long, but actually it, it turns over so quick. And I'm sure you've got guys in the peloton now like that. And you're like, mate, you're like literally one years old when I when I turned pro, or maybe yeah. not even born. Yeah, no, like they were. Josh Tarlin, like when we were in Mallorca last year, I was like, geez, mate, I've been coming to this island. It, we were in December camp in Mallorca. I was like, been coming here every year since you were born, mate. Like the year you were born, <laughs> I was here grafting away. It's just, uh, yeah, it's mad. It's mad, but. It definitely, I think being amongst all the younger guys though it, and being a pro bike rider, it definitely, I don't know, keeps you immature maybe, but it just keeps you mm. uh, keeps you younger. As soon as you leave, I think, and well, you can tell me, like once you retire, you hang out with mm. people more your own age. I feel like it must be different. It is, it is it's actually very true what you said, you know, and, and often um, people sort of underestimate the age that you are and think that maybe you're younger, maybe because you're immature or maybe because I think, I think the physical activeness, like I'm very happy to be active all the time, whether it's running, riding, you know, or even just running up the street with the kids and doing stuff that people, you know, often sort of go, well, I'm not going to do that. The kids will, that's the kids stuff. And you're like, mm. well, how old is that guy? And you're like, find out they're like five, six years younger than you. And you're like, yeah. Jesus, you know, yeah. where are you, what, what, where are you off to? Um, I think I've done some medical stuff in the last couple of years to, to explore the benefits of being a pro, you know, what actually happens. And yeah, whether it's pro cycling or whether pro sports, it, it does give you a leap ahead. You know, even though sometimes I'm sure you agree with me, you're like, geez, boys, just lost about three years of my life today on that Giro stage. <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, it's not true. We we are, what it's done to your heart inside, it, it sort of gives you like a really good head start to that next part of your life. Yeah, I think the mental side as well, like obviously mm. the physical, but I think just the mental, like having that focus and goal and, um, and like – for me, like I have the off season, if I have a month off, like even after a week, you're a bit like, I'm oh, feeling a bit lethargic now and be like, oh, it's the off season though, I'll just have a few more beers and whatever, enjoy it. Once you start riding again and pushing yourself and having a bit of a sweat, you just feel so much better in yourself. I mm. think just that, just that exercise in general, just, well, the, you know, the endorphins and everything and, you know, it, you just feel so much better for it. I've said it recently a lot. I really do think that I am addicted to exercise because I get that sort of scratchiness if I haven't gone out and gone. And look, I'm not doing anything anywhere near what I used to. You know, I'm talking about five, six hours of exercise a week, but I still need that half hour run or whatever mm. it is. Um, I want to talk to you about the team, the the B 
being in a different team and being back to rewind back to those track days, and it's something really special. You know, I wasn't on the track for ages, just did some things within the team's pursuit as well. But there was something different about that, and people might wonder and think about the track. I don't often talk about the track much on this podcast, but it's about, you know, like, why would you ride around in a circle all that time? What do you get out of that? You know, all this Hmm. sort of stuff. But it's quite a different environment, and when you really get in that, and I can see, well, I'm assuming it was something that you you really loved and really that it's really structured and it's really sort of repetitive, but there's something about the group and that there's something really in it. And you obviously went to a much better, greater level than I did and there was a lot more pressure. Tell me a little bit about what the track sort of gave you and what you enjoyed about it and how you think that sort of contributed to the rest of your career as a, as a pro. Well, it, it gave me so much. I think the main thing is just that focus and drive for one goal because there's not much racing on the track really. There's a couple mm. of World Cups, of Worlds and Olympics and having that big goal of like the, the Worlds and then obviously the Olympics every four years, that's the one thing now is my biggest strength really is having that one big target and focusing in on that, everything else mm. is, is a build up to it. And um, yeah, just getting yourself in the best shape possible for a certain date. And I think, um, yeah, that, that, that was one of the big things. And then obviously um, a specific, you know, the track with, and it can be intense and the training is mm. um, like in a team pursuit is, you know, by 0.1 of a second, like a laugh mm. is like analyzed and scrutinized and your changes and stuff. And, um, and then physically, I think um, just that raw power, like power at speed as well on the flat in like that aero position. Um, and then just the bunch racing as well, you know, the, the positioning and just being able to maneuver around. And, um, you know, Madison is like all the skills you get from that. I think it just sets you up like perfectly. And yeah, I think anyone really, no matter what age, um, I think just, just a bit of track racing certainly helps and the cadence and everything even though mm. probably one of the slowest peddlers in the peloton now <laughs> but um yeah i think it just gives you gives you so much rewinding back to there because like the british i don't know much about how it all came about but like the british cycling academy or the olympic academy sort of was kicking off really with um rod ellingsworth in two uh, 2003 i think if correct me if yeah. i'm wrong here but there's a certain core group that really came out of there that you guys sort of, in a way, in my opinion, sort of really floated the eventual Sky. You know, you guys were so key to the success of, you know, Sky where it went. You know, we go sort of being a little bit before that and then coming in later. But you that that real core group, you know, Rowie, you, Rowie yourself, you know, um, Swifty and even Cav, in a way. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm probably missing a million guys. But tell me a little bit about that whole academy and, and sort of coming through that because – as Aussies, you know, we, we were like, oh, that bloody academy, you know, we're always trying to go up against you guys and mm. you guys seem to be always on the, the forefront um, and having everything that little bit better and just being that that step above it always felt like. Oh, you're right. Uh, that's funny you say that because we always saw you guys as in front of us. Like for me, anyway, <laughs> you know, like Gossi and, and Clarky and because they, they were the, my year really and, and in Italy, they were always sort of always just a bit ahead of me. Like Gossi won a few mm. big races, didn't he, and stuff, so. It's funny you say that, but that rivalry was great and, and that sort of um, drove both of us on really. But yeah, for me, the academy was, it was like an apprenticeship, you know, it was a great way to just learn how to be, firstly, you're 18, you move away from home, mm. just just being able to fend for yourself and just be organized and, you know, cook your meals and know, be organized as in planning the next day, not just food wise but you know your kit and you know just mm. hygiene and just staying on top of everything and if you're getting <laughs> a bit sick how you look after yourself and you know contacting the right people to help you with your bike or you know yeah your doctor or some clothing or whatever it is and the actual racing and the training was obviously important don't get me wrong but I think everything else around that was was just as important really to Rod and, and that's how he drilled it into us and just being disciplined and and all that type of stuff. And um, that's the one thing that I see now with the young guys in our team. Anyway, I can't speak for other teams, but when they turn pro, like, it's a big shock. You know, like AJ, he's American. He, he moves over to Andorra. He's 18. It's his first time he's lived away from home. He's in a different country, different culture, away from his family, friends. Like, yeah, like in Andorra, he obviously knows a few people, but Andorra's a pretty big place and spread out. And it's um, it must be so much harder for, for him to just deal with everything, like, the lifestyle changed apart from just turning pro at such a young age. So um, the academy was amazing for us. And and as you say, like so many guys 
came through it and had amazing careers out of it. You know, um, had Pete Kenyuk as well. And um, mm. it was just like uh, a great way to sort of set us up and be ready for, for what's to come, really. Well, the strength of that bond, the reason I want to sort of talk about that was something pretty amazing happened last year at the end of the Giro. Um, and, you know, not necessarily from, from the academy, but the, the bond between you guys, you often see it, you know, whether that was created at Sky, whether it's – you see it across the teams, but something – the last stage of the Giro last year, Mark Cavendish was going for a stage win and you were sitting second on GC. Look at this. Geraint Thomas looks across to Luis Leon Sanchez, who's helping Mark Cavendish, says, get on my wheel and ride. And Geraint Thomas is keeping Mark Cavendish close to the front here. Just less than two kilometres to go. Well, could you wish for a better man at this point? You don't often see this, if ever. Mm. And let alone another teammate, and let alone another team rider helping an opposite team, let alone a guy sitting second on GC came up, coming up, giving Cav the nod. Cavendish jumps on your wheel and uh, you start the lead out. Well, actually, he was two wheels behind. You start the lead out from, I think it was a couple K out, and just mm. line it out for him as a mate. Like, I don't know. I've never really heard the, the story from, from anyone. I've only watched it and just was like blown away by that moment. Tell me about that. That was yeah. that was insane <laughs> to see that happen. Yeah, I think firstly it was kind of afterwards I was thinking, well, people this might kick off in a bad way, actually. <laughs> you know, <laughs> me helping someone from another team, but it was quite the opposite. You know, everyone just seemed to love it. And um but yeah, no, I think um he actually jokingly came up to me um halfway through the stage, like, oh lad, if you're gonna lead me out, go on the right here, blah blah blah. I was like, Oh yeah, yeah. all right, mate, whatever. Um <laughs> But then yeah, what we went through three K to go and I was like there and I was like well I'm fine <laughs> you know GC's done and I knew he didn't have much teammates and I just saw he only had um, Lewis Leon Sanchez with him and that's right I was like oh sod it it's safe for me on the front anyway so yeah as you say it was around 2k to go and just went and 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 strung it out and took it to about a k to go and and swung off and let him go and um yeah I think Gaviria did the best lead out though hitting out so early mm. as he does and <laughs> properly set him up but no it was just I don't know it was normal it was just like it wasn't it was just something i was like well I, yeah well you just help your mate out um and yeah as you start we've been racing with each other since well we were like 14 and then we obviously lived together on the academy like you say and um we were only in in the sky for what we've only been professional together for one year in 2012 but for me it didn't really seem like a big deal to be honest which probably sounds mm. a bit weird but like if you if we think back to the our academy days been like oh yeah, last stage of the Giro, I'm going to be second and I'm going to be leading you out for the win in a different team. It's just, you'd just be, just be blown away, wouldn't you? Like, you'd just be like, absolutely no chance that, that would ever happen. But yeah. Well, that's the stuff you sort of joke about out training. You know, you're mm. like, oh yeah, you know, I'm going up the climb, I'm leading this race and you talk through, you know, your dream scenarios. You don't ever believe it. Another sort of dream scenario was that lead out. Well, I, I call it the long lead out. It's, it was super long in 2011, um, world championships mm. GB for Cav you know we we hated it because you know Gossi was second but the way you guys sort of bossed that um, and started that lead out from you know whatever it was from the start of the race practically mm. um, that just sort of showed that and that was sort of intertwined and that's what I was trying to get at is something's always special about going back and riding world championships and and being back with your own countrymen and and doing that lead out i can imagine even though you're riding on a british team with a lot of british guys there's something about riding with your old mates that you used to you know for me riding with clarky we grew up racing and staying in each other's house you know all through juniors and then when we came together in a team or we saw each other in in different scenarios you'd always be helping each other out because it just felt right didn't it yeah 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 it's the same now like with with swifty for instance like it's, it's amazing to just ride the Giro with him and um, you know, be on the podium with with him working for gas for me, like from everything we've been through. Same with Luke, you know, when I won the tour, he was there and I've said it numerous times, but when we were kids, we were dancing in his front room for his mum and his nan doing the full Monty, you know, like it's just like nuts how things just, but that those bonds between us, like, as you say, that core group of, you know, five or six of us is, is always going to be there. And, um, it's nothing like being in the army, going to war and all that. But when you hear yeah. those guys talk about that bond they have, it is a similar, yeah, brotherhood sounds a bit strong, but just, just that real, yeah, connection you got. And it's always, it'll always be there because you've always you've just grown up together and been through, through so much together. 
You spoke about the tour. We've got, we got to talk about the tour. Um, I guess really, I guess in your own words, what is the Tour de France for you? It, to me, it's this, it just represents cycling. Like the yellow jersey, I think, probably more than any other sport people will know. Like if you show someone the yellow jersey and mm. Football World Cup even, I think, I don't think there'll be many people, it would be similar, you know, if not more people would know the yellow jersey is cycling than the Football World Cup is the world for football, like the actual trophy now. And it's just, you know, everyone knows it and it just, to just wear that jersey even for a day, it's almost like you're representing the whole sport, you know, and it's mm. just got this real aura and prestige about it and it's um, the history there. You know, and the thought of just like when you race up these mountains and when you think in the past that all the guys that have raced up there before, and not just the guys that have done well, but everyone that's groveled up there, you know, in the Gruppetto mm. and had bad days and all these stories of just um, guys just going so deep and, you know, pushing themselves to the limit, um, whether that's at the front or the back. And um, yeah, the tour is just the the biggest thing. And, and now obviously it's just so much more commercial and everything. It's just a massive difference from that to to the Giro or any other race, really. Um, so yeah, then to, like when I won the prologue in in seventeen in Dusseldorf, that was just unreal. And um, mm. but then to come back the year later and just the way it went was just um, was nuts, really. Yeah. Well, it's changed. Let's talk about that year. I was going to ask you just before we get to that, how has it changed in your mind over the years? You know, because you know, in that first tour, the the Barlow World Tour, and you know, I guess you're probably thinking, "Wow, that's great! I've have done the tour, I've done one tour." You know, you're probably not thinking, "I'll do multiple, maybe I'll get another chance another time, let alone win it." I don't know. Maybe you were sitting there going, "I'm going to win this thing one day. This is not no. too bad." Or you were thinking, "I don't know." And then there was the the period where you're working for, you know, Froomey and just going, "How cool is this? We won mm. the actual tour." And then I guess, you know, 2018. Run me through the different thought processes through those phases of of your relationship with the tour. Yeah, so 07, I was just like, how can anyone come here trying to win it? Like, just to get around this thing is mm. hard enough, you know? And um, But then the next year I did the Giro and just felt so much more comfortable. And I think it just brought me on so much. And, um, like, I've never suffered as much as that, ever. Like, if I ever think I'm tired now, just think back to how I was in 07 and it just, I'm, just <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not so bad. Um, <laughs> but then, yeah, as, as you say, like, it, you, you move on, you get better and... Missed out on 2012 when Brad won because I was riding the track, so skipped the the tour, and I was devastated to miss that. To be honest, I, mm. I just I, I was just really wanted to be a part of that. So then in 13, when Froomey won, and I was there, um, I fractured my pelvis on the first stage in Corsica, mm. but got better through the race and w- w- was able to contribute, <laughs> and it was just amazing, like how to be a part of that and rising onto the Champs Elysees with the yellow jersey in the team, and then every year you know, progressing, getting better, getting deeper into the mountains, you know, getting further up the last climb. And then um, I guess it was 2015. I was still fourth on GC going into stage 19 and um, I had a bad day. I was, you know, I'd been doing so much like work on the front in the wind. Like it was, there was cobbles when I was riding on the front and, you know, and then in the mountains and, and all this. And I cracked that day and just went into Gruppetto to try and save a bit for the next day because we did Alpes twice. And, um, so were you thinking at that point, like, hey, I can I can actually do something here? Clearly, if you're fourth on G C. Yeah, I think after that race, I looked back and I was like, oh, geez, man, like, if I just looked after myself and didn't do so much work, surely I could get those other two stages ticked off and I'd be top five. And I was thinking, I definitely want to give this a go. So then in 16, that was when I was like, that was the start of my sort of um, Grand Tour, well, targeting the Grand Tours, really. Were you were you understanding though? Because there's one thing, and we see it a lot with a lot of riders who support, you know, as super domestiques and get very close. And we always say, "Oh, imagine that guy if he could be the leader himself." But ultimately, when they change teams, they understand like, "Oh, actually, leading a team is pretty hard." Yeah, yeah I might physically have the ability, but I've actually got to be on for three weeks. Were you starting to tap into, okay, physically, I think I can do it, but I can see what Froomey has to do, or yeah, well, or Richie or whoever else you're working for at that time. And I think the mentality is ridiculous, but I can actually, I can get it. Or you had no idea what it was like leading. Yeah, it definitely took a lot from Froomey and Brad and, and, and Richie and the likes. And I think going back to those track days, like when you sat mm. there in the, in the chair before Team Pursuit final, mm. you know, and that intensity of it, like you, you got, what, well, four, three, fifty, whatever it is, minutes of the race and, 
one tiny mistake and screw it up, not just for yourself, but the other th- three guys you're racing with. That intensity what position and that were pressure. You? I was three. Well, uh, man, that's, three. Oh, that was a lovely position. Just roll in, no Perfect, pressure. Perfect, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was fourth. I loved fourth. You could really roll in on the back there. Exactly, yeah. So, um, <laughs> but like, I think that gave me so much as well, like dealing with that pressure and stuff. And, and yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that the mental side of things, I was almost more ready than physically, I think. Um, yeah, cool. And I just, um, yeah, it was just something I really wanted to give a go. And then I knew to lead the tour was, was going to be pretty much impossible the way through me was going. So it was kind of like, oh, the Giro can target that first and then, you know, look to maybe do the tour as well at some point. But I was always ambitious and always wanted to to go for it. But I just never... I, t- I you know, I'd chat to Dave about it and, and Tim, my coach, but I'd never go further than that, really. I'm not one to sort of tell everyone what I want to do and talk about it. You know, I just keep that in my head and keep that like determination and sort of and focus in my head and, and, and just deal with it like that and not, yeah, go around blowing my own trumpet. But um, yeah, and then 16 was the first. It was more in 16, I was like, right, I want to be backup leader for Froomey. That was the next step, really, for me. Yeah. Um, mm. But you know what it's like? You, you're like, oh, last year I was good and I was like 68. So oh, this year from 67, I'm going to absolutely fly. Mm. But it was just totally opposite and I was just <laughs> terrible. So it's a lot of learning in that regard as well. You know, it's um, the new 68 was better and then, yeah, I didn't push it so much then. What about, give us give us some perspective here about, um, body image um, or body weight, let's just say that. What were you sort of at the peak in the track and the classics and how's it sort of changed over the years to find out? Because you know, exactly what you pointed out there, you've, and that's what I was trying to say at the start, you've got to go to 67 to understand, cool, that's mm. the limit, that's, I don't need to do that. And if you don't go there, you always wonder, wonder what 67 is or whatever it is. Yeah, um, exactly. It's like 80, 85, 86, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> But what 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 is that sort of progression? Because I think a lot of people would not really understand. You know, there's been a massive transition in body. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's a lot of trial and error as well. But on the track, I guess mid seventies, easily seventy five. You know, it's all about power. Like weight was insignificant, mm. really. Um, and then the the classics was like low seventies, maybe seventy one, seventy two. Um, and when I was looking to perform in like Paris Nice and Romandie, these type of races, and you try and go like low seventies. Um, and yeah, over the years as well, like you slowly, for me anyway, it's, it's, it's certainly not natural to be down at that mm. sort of weight. So it took a lot of effort and, uh, and time, but, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, it was a big difference in it, 68 to 75. Like, yeah. so at the pointy end, it's really hard, but now I feel like I, I can get down there, but I have to be so on it to get there. I need that rebound and come up. And, um, some people might see that as as being unprofessional when you put on weight in the winter and things. But for me, it's, it's, I need those peaks and troughs to, well, I definitely need the troughs to get to the peaks. You know what I mean? And, and for my body yeah. as well, I think, I don't know, like, to be so low, it's not great for the body like for a prolonged period. I think I can only really stay there for, you know, six, eight weeks tops type thing. So to then rebound and come up, I think your body just, it just soaks everything up and just like repairs itself is kind of the wrong way of wording it. But just um, just recovers from it, I think, and then mm. you can get back down to that again. But everyone's different, aren't they? And then you know, some guys are a lot naturally just a lot lighter and, and built for it. But for me, it was it's always kind of been that that big fight to get down to it. Really, what about the sacrifice then? Because you know, it's something that it's a big part of it, and this is something that I. I wouldn't say struggle to understand, but have a lot of respect for you to be able to keep making the sacrifice year in year out. Um, you know, my wife was on 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 board with me. She has to be because, like, when you're doing these crazy, you know, strip downs, there's no point your wife sitting in the corner going, "Yeah, good luck for that. I'm just going to order another dessert and drink this glass of wine over <laughs> here." You know, you're like, "Yeah, good on you. you." Everyone's on board. Everyone's on the you know the GT um, wagon or you know the Mitch Docker wagon when I was trying to do something. Um, and now with your son involved, for me, when I had my first child, it was great. He was there. And I kept going about my thing. But when I had my second child, I, I couldn't handle the sacrifice. I was like, what am mm-hmm. I doing? What, what am I missing? So that's something that I really had to deal with and, and really fight. And when I was fighting myself, I couldn't go on with it. Um, I didn't want to. I think that was a big point. I didn't want to. It sounds like for me, 
in order to do what you're wanting to do, you have to want to do that. You have to want to make that sacrifice. You have to want to be at that weight. You can't force yourself to do those things. Yeah. It's much too hard. Tell me a little bit about the sacrifice to become yeah, a Tour de France winner, I guess, and continually be at the front. Yeah, it's definitely hard, but I guess for me, it's kind of like, right, I know if I do this and I and I make it, I'm going to be there or thereabouts. And if I'm going to carry on racing and, and be there in the pointy end, like to carry on racing, I, I love racing, enjoy racing, but I only enjoy it when you're in the front and competitive. Mm. So I need to commit to this. And I do enjoy the process of it and the, the journey, so to speak, you know, the altitude camps and like you feel yourself getting better. And obviously the diet and the restricting things is tough and that's the hardest bit by far. Well, actually, no, the, the time away from family is, is the biggest mm. one. But, you know, like you say, when when my wife is is fully behind me and luckily for me, she's not a big drinker and she's not massive foodie. So that does make it easier, I guess. Nice. Um, yeah. But like, it's the whole thing and you go out for dinner and she orders the steak and I order the fish and they bring it and they give me the steak and saw the fish and you're just like doing <laughs> that swap over the table. But um, no, it's just... That support back home is 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 a massive thing as well. Like for me, I, they saw and Max, my son, they they they're well happy at the minute that in the life we have. And Max is happy in school in Monaco, and and Sarah's got her little life that she's happy with, and and that helps a lot as well. Because if they weren't enjoying it, there's there's absolutely no way I'd still be racing now, just because mm. they wouldn't be happy. And I don't really need to do this, but yeah, as I say, I just I still really. In, enjoy it and that process of you know having a big goal working towards it you know having your plan and setting out the, the phase, different phases and having that little team around you where you know your nutritionist and the coach and yeah the the planning and 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 everything and going on that I keep saying it that journey I sound like I'm a hippie or something but you know what I mean like <laughs> with the boys you know you're all there together and you've like you've got these different camps and steps along the way and it's all I've done as well. Like since I was a junior, you know, you've always had that big goal that you're working towards. So um, I still really love it. And the fact that I'm still competitive was a big thing as well, really. Like if I wasn't, I, I certainly wouldn't be doing it now because I have all those sacrifices and, and all those big commitments. I don't know, it's, this will sound really selfish now, but to just do it for somebody else, I, I wouldn't be able to, to mm. commit to that, I don't think. Speaking about that then, going to the tour, your role there and you know i guess you know speaking about the tour off the back of what we were saying with 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 your win in 2018 it was the change of the guard but very quickly it was the change of the guard again in 2019 with egan um now your role at the you're just writing gc at the at the giro to come to the tour and and go into that you know supporting role you just mentioned it then how how do you handle that you know like because you know, you you've got the goods you've done the sacrifice how do you comfortably go back into that role that you, you know, once you were very good at doing, but you've been at the top, you've had other guys working for me. How do you suddenly take a step back? Yeah, I think um, for me, it's it's quite easy this time because it's kind of like I did the Giro and it's like, right, commit to these four weeks, stay on it and, and go to the tour, the biggest bike race in the world. And and personally, um, to try and go for a stage for sure. And even to, to go for a stage, you need to be flying, you know, and then to step into the role of helping whoever it is, like Egan or Carlos. And just to be in the front with them, I think um, that's still exciting when it's the tour. Um, and, you know, I've kind of, I've had my big hit now with the Giro. You know, it went, it went as well as it could have. Like, I feel like I, I did everything I could and there was no glaring mistakes, the preparation, everything. Um, so that was almost a good tick in the box for, it's been a success almost this this season now, you know, and this tour now is a bonus round. You know, I can see my end of career as well next year, you know, I'm, I'm very <laughs> likely going to stop and it's just like, it's the biggest bike race in the world. Let's go there and, and try to enjoy it and race hard, get stuck in. And um, there's no pressure, you know, I, I don't feel like I've got anything left to prove. It feels like most years I've been like, right, I've got to prove that I'm good enough to lead. I've got to prove yeah. that I can win this and then you win it. I've got, I've got to prove it wasn't a, a fluke. You know, and then there's always people that just sort of, oh, he's old now, he's past it. He's like, yeah. oh, I'll prove those fuckers wrong. And it's just <laughs> always something you got to, you, you just like fighting to prove people wrong almost. And, um, but now going into the tour, it's a bit more, I don't want to sound like it's, it's, I'm blase about it now and, and still don't have that drive, but it's just like, just go there and just really soak it up and still race your guts out, but, um, try and soak it up as well and enjoy it. 
could be also proving that, hey, I can actually be an ultimate teammate too. You know, it's not always yeah, exactly. always just about me. There's another proof there too. Hey, I'm I'm on board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the biggest thing though for me now is is just the unknown. Because I really don't like normally when I'm going to a big race, like a big target. As I said before, I've, I've prepared well and I'm confident in what I've done, and I go there knowing pretty much what I can do. Whereas now it's mm. like, for after the Giro and this block is a bit, you know, yeah, you, spicy. You, yeah, you're not unsure. A bit unsure, like. Am I doing enough? Do I need to do a few more efforts? Do I need to do less? Is because I've never done Giro Tour back to back before, so that's that is a strange feeling. And and until I get into that race, the first few days, I'm not sure how I'm going to be in the peloton either. But um, should be okay. Hopefully, it'll be okay. But um, yeah, we'll see. Lastly, mate, we're recording a podcast um, while you're on the road, and this is something that you love doing. Um, you've got. Rowy involved, what's mm. occurring, and uh, your own little podcast as well. Tell me about that. Tell me about the podcast world, mate, and um, being on the road recording. How did yeah. it all come about, and what do you what do you think of it? Oh, it's good. It's a good way of just. Um, I wouldn't say switching off because we talk about cycling all the time, but it's it all started in 2019 tour. Me and Luke started what's occurring, and basically we were just like jokingly saying, oh, "If we do a podcast now, we don't have to speak to any media tomorrow. Just say listen to the pod, mate." But didn't yeah. exactly work out like that. But since then, it's just grown and grown and had my own little one on the sides. And, but now we've combined them both together under the same sort of um, banner, so to speak. And no, it's, it's great. You know, I think it's a good way to sort of, um, for one, get your point across, like how you, just what you want to say about the race mm. or, I don't know, coming up to a big goal or whatever. And yeah, I think just giving a, an opinion on the racing and stuff. Sometimes the biggest thing for me and Luke is, we forget that it's a podcast sometimes and we yeah. turn into a bit of like, <laughs> like your bus chat, you know, and you just start ripping a few people and just taking the piss, just being like a bit, you know, ban banter or whatever. But yeah. suddenly it can be released sometimes that, like, oh yeah, maybe we shouldn't have been quite so harsh. Like, but, <laughs> um, but I think just giving an honest opinion about racing and tactics and I think people enjoy that and um, that's nice to do for sure. Um, mm. And then when you get guests on as well, there's, you know, we've had some pretty big hitters on. And um, I think when you know them, they're just so much more relaxed as well. Uh, mm. It's not, And we definitely don't see it like interviewing people, but um, and neither do they, which is a good thing. And then you can just have a bit of a joke and a laugh. And yeah, and it's just something a bit different. And especially when you think about stopping as well, like Luke now is something that he can continue to do and also set him up to do some stuff for Eurosport and whatever. And so um, that was the thinking as well. It was just like, yeah. Yeah, like I said, we started in 19. I didn't think I'd still be racing in 2024, 25. But uh, no, I do enjoy it. It's just um, I do a lot of it from the massage table as well, which is a bit different in it, but it's all good. Mate, it's awesome. I think uh, I enjoy listening to it. I think everyone else does too. Mate, I'm going to let you get into training. Thank you for coming on the pod. Great to chat with you. Pleasure. Cheers. Thanks for having me, mate. And uh, yeah, catch you soon, maybe. See you at the tour. Sweet. Well, we're on the eve of the tour and you may have been listening to me over at the Cycling Podcast, but I'll be heading across there as well to cover it on the Cycling Podcast. So if you want to hear my voice, you can hear me over there each day. I'll be over there covering the tour, but it was cool to hear from G. What a good guy he is. What a legend. And he will be there at the tour as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing him close hand at the buses or around, or you guys can watch him on TV. I hope you enjoyed his side and what his story actually, because he speaks so well and it was easy just to sit back and chat with him while he's on training camp. While he held the boys up from training, he made time to chat with me too. So it was pretty cool. Big thanks goes out to our major partner, MAP, you guys for listening, and Red Bricks Media for putting this podcast together. Guys, we'll have another episode for you next week. The Race Communique is coming to you. That will be the preview for the Tour de France. And like I said at the top of the episode, if you haven't got yourself a life in the Peloton book, I do not know what you are doing. Until then, cheers, guys. That iconic music in this episode was composed by none other than the legend, Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.